It is quite amazing. I mean, usually, so this is a very big collaboration of people and usually word leaks out somewhere. The sort of analogous thing that happened not that long ago were the first results about gravitational waves. And there, there were kind of nods and winks going on. And if you knew the right people, then you could probably get a little bit of an inside track. This, there has been absolutely nothing. They've really kept it completely under wraps. The data they're going to be presenting today was actually taken in 2017. So they've been analysing it for the last couple of years. It's kind of the nature of this data. It is incredibly complex. So actually getting it to a point where you go from the raw data to something that looks like an impressive in image is a lot of work. Um, and they, so that would have taken most of the last couple of years. But uh, at this point, they must know that they've got something good. So this thing called the event horizon is kind of that point of no return. It's the point where you can know even light can no longer escape from, from the region around a black hole. The region we would hope to see today is a bit bigger than that. It's probably about two or three times that event horizon size. Um, really because, well, it's because the distorting effects are so strong, because what we're actually going to see is sort of light from around the black hole, radio wave light. Um, and that radio wave light is originating a little bit further away. And also, this, you've got this massive object in the case of the one in the middle of Milky Way. It's about four million times the mass of the sun, which really means that the paths of light, you think about light traveling in straight lines, but because the gravitational field is so intense and the space time is so curved, the light actually travels in very bent paths. The technique they're using is a thing called very long baseline interferometry. So the object that they're trying to resolve the, the size of this, the event horizon is about 30 times the radius of the sun. So it's absolutely tiny at the distance of the galactic center. Um, and uh, the region that they're trying to see is a bit bigger than that, but it's still absolutely tiny. The, the analogy that's been drawn is it's like trying to take a picture of a golf ball on the moon. Okay, so the technique, they, and the, and the technique they're using really involves making the diameter of the telescope bigger and bigger. And so one thing you can do is instead of having a single telescope, is have multiple telescopes. And then as you move them further and further apart, the sharpness of the image increases because of the, the ultimate sharpness is limited by the distance between your two most distant parts of your telescope. In the technique they're using, they're actually recording the data on different radio telescopes all around the world. So D is enormous. It's the diameter of the Earth is the diameter of the telescope they're using. But then the tricky part is then having collected all that data, you then have to combine it all together. And that's this, the, the technique that they're using, this thing called very long baseline interferometry involves taking all that signal. Um, and actually, it's so, they collect so much data, it's not something you can just transfer over the internet. They actually end up recording the data on hard drives, shipping the hard drives to a place where you can kind of correlate all that data together and combining the, the information from the telescopes to extract an image from it. So the, the trouble is everyone has in their mind the, the movie Interstellar, right? Because they had the most amazing graphics of what one of these supermassive black holes would look like. Um, and they were actually, you know, they had real physicists involved in it. There was actually lots of serious general relativistic calculations went into making those, uh, those graphics for the movie. Of course, the trouble is they could do that at whatever resolution they wanted. We're limited by the resolution that we can achieve with the wavelengths that we have, with the diameter of the Earth that we have, which really means that you're not going to see those incredibly pin sharp images. The whole thing is going to be a bit blurry. Um, but hopefully it's going to be a blurry image of something really exciting and a blurry image of something really exciting is probably pretty exciting itself. There is one other thing to mention which is that there's another candidate out there. They're actually observed two objects. So they observed the object in the middle of the, of the Milky Way um, which is this black hole of about four million times the mass of the, of the Sun. Um, they also were looking at the black hole in the middle of a much bigger galaxy, Messier 87, in the middle of the Virgo cluster. Um, which is several thousand times further away, so actually the, the, the quality of the images will be several thousand times poorer because you're trying to look at something further away, so everything's much smaller. But the black hole in the middle of Messier 87 is several thousand times bigger than the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way. And it turns out that uh, uh, event horizon size scales with the mass of the, of the black hole. So if you've got a black hole which is a couple of thousand times bigger, uh, in mass, then its, its event horizon will be a couple of thousand times bigger as well. So the whole thing scales up in size. So it turns out the ultimate sharpness of the image that they'll get from the, the black hole in the middle of Messier 87 is about the same as from the Milky Way. Um, and it's a bit of a toss up which one's going to make the nicer pictures. I think my betting's still on the Milky Way because it's actually it works out when you do the calculations, it works out you end up with slightly sharper images for the Milky Way, but there's not much in it. Well, I can check with another yeah. This is the galaxy M87. 
And this is the first double image of a black hole. But these images are not sufficient. If you want to know what a black hole looks like, um, so, from our chatting before the press conference, I was wrong and I was right. I was wrong because I picked the wrong black hole. I said they were looking at two, the one at the middle of the Milky Way and the one in Messier 87, and I thought they'd be more likely to find something about our one. Um, but it turns out that this is the one they got the result from. Today's announcement was pretty special, actually, because I've been working on black holes myself for 20 years. I did my PhD in black holes. I've been working on them ever since in one form or another. So today feels like quite a profound day. Um, and to make it even more special, I was watching the press release downstairs uh, with my, my six-year-old son. And uh, he had his toy black hole with him. And he was sitting there comparing it with the thing on the screen. And it does look more or less as we were talking about before, that there is this kind of ring of fire effect. Um, that, or more particularly, you're kind of not seeing any light from the middle there. And it really is just down to this effect that the light is being so bent by this black hole somewhere in the middle there that the light you're seeing kind of coming out around the sides is actually being emitted around the back of the black hole and being bent right round. So being bent by 90 degrees and more to head towards us and in, in, into our line of sight. And that really is sort of the definition of strong gravity, right? I'm coming late to the party here. It is currently uh, 2.40 Nottingham time and it's been half an hour since the results were released. Um, in that time, I've been interviewing prospective undergraduates um, and I actually made them sit down and watch the press release up until the point where we saw the image of the black hole. And then I, I thought we better get on with the business of the, the interviews. He said, yes, it looks, it looks like our toy black hole, um, but the real black hole doesn't have eyes and the real black hole isn't as cute and cuddly as this one. And he said, my toy black hole doesn't have the ring of fire around it. We know that light gets bent by Gravity, this has been known for actually almost exactly 100 years. The first measurements of this effect were made almost exactly 100 years ago um, when they were looking at the, what happens during a total eclipse of the sun where stars near the sun, the position of the star shifts a little bit just because the light from those stars is being bent a tiny bit by the, by, by the gravity of the sun. So we've known about this effect in kind of that weak gravity limit that things light can get bent a tiny bit by something as massive as the sun. Now we're talking about light getting bent through 90 degrees and more uh, and now you're talking about really, really strong gravitational fields. So that gets us very much into the Einstein end of general relativity. If you were just presented with a picture like that and say, what's going on? You could come up with many explanations as to what it was. That there's a, there was a, do a cosmic donut out there in space or there's a sphere and you're seeing the edges of a sphere or whatever. You know, there are lots of ways you could explain. There are many things in space that look like rings. But the thing is here, they said, OK, so we think that general relativity is right and we think there's a massive black hole in the middle of these galaxies, and we think that it's got a lot of this sort of radio emitting material around it, what would we expect to see if those things were the truth? And then they predicted, this is what you ought to see, pretty much. And then you go out and take the picture, and there it is. And then so in some sense, that's the best proof there ever is, is when you actually predict something before you go and see it. Um, and so I think, this, in that sense, this probably is the best evidence there has ever been for a supermassive black hole in the middle of a galaxy. Again, there are lots of ways that, that you can get those kind of asymmetries. The most likely, I think, uh, is that what's actually happening is that the material is rotating. It's not, it's not just sort of uniformly spread around there, it's actually spinning around. Because we know further out there's a disk of material which is spinning around, so the stuff we're seeing close to the black hole is probably in a rather turbulent, messy way, still rotating around. And what happens is the bit that's coming towards you gets a big boost in energy, this, this thing called the Doppler effect. And in light, the way, one of the ways that manifests itself is that the light gets a lot brighter, there's a lot more energy in it. Whereas the stuff that's going away from you, you see it uh, a lower energy, and so you, you basically see it as fainter. And so I think that asymmetry we're seeing there is just to do with the rotation of material around the black hole. I mean, there's a lot of structure there as well. That it looks like there's something that points out this way as well, which I'm kind of intrigued by. And again, one of the things that might be expected is you might expect jets of material to be flying out of the black hole, um, and the material would probably be rotating around those jets of material. So it sort of fits together, but again, that's kind of a, down near the the limits of what you can actually see on an image like that. But. This, I really, this is just my very first reaction to it. Um, so I am really looking forward to reading about the science that's come out of this, about whether the structures that I'm seeing in the background here are real and what they mean. 
um, and just how these predictions match up, not just on a qualitative level, but on a quantitative level to the data that's actually been gathered. I mean, the other thing that you sort of have to take your hats off to the people involved in this experiment is you have to bear in mind the technique they're using, VLBI, it's not just like taking a picture with a camera. You've got to take all these data from all these different radio telescopes, combine them all together, and from that, so basically you take sort of every pair of radio telescopes and you get a bit of information from the sort of the phase delay, the difference in the signal between each pair. And each of those gives you a little bit of a picture, but actually you don't have the whole picture. And it is, it's essentially because, you know, if you've got a, a regular camera, you've kind of got your lens or your mirror, if it's a telescope, is sort of filling the entire aperture. In this case, you've just got a few dishes sort of scattered within your aperture. That means there's a lot of missing information, which means that you then have to kind of reconstruct that missing information. And there are actually, there isn't generally a unique solution to this. So there is a little bit of kind of prejudice that goes into this that says, because you can, you know, there are many different images you could reconstruct from those data. Most of them look completely ridiculous. And so you can sort of throw them out on the basis that they look unphysical, that they, they're just very noisy, or they just that, that don't match what you'd expect from a real astronomical object. Um, and so there's sort of a lot of processing that has to go into turning this data into an image. Now what's going to happen over time is more and more dishes get added to this network of telescopes. So you have more and more pairs of telescopes, which gives you more and more information. So as time goes on, they're going to be repeating these experiments with more and more information. So the images will get better and better and there'll be less of that kind of interpolation of figuring out the missing data, just because there'll be less missing data. Um, but for the moment, there's a lot of work that has to go into turning uh, the raw data into an image like this. And so that's, I think, fundamentally the reason why it's taken all the time from when they took the data two years ago to now to actually produce an image like this from the data they collected. So there's talk about putting radio telescopes into space because remember what dictates the sharpness of the image is how far apart your most distant parts of your telescope are. If you could put your telescopes into orbit, if you could put one of them on the moon, if you could put them all into orbit around the sun, then in principle you can make longer and longer baselines. There's not a lot to this picture, is there, really? It's like, you know, it's a ring with a hole in the middle. But actually, I think that's absolutely astounding. How amazing is that, that, that you know, millions of light years away, you can actually see a black hole in another galaxy down to the scale. I mean, the black hole, remember, the, the, the black region in the middle, it's about three times the ultimate size of the black hole itself. So the black hole itself is actually not much smaller than this. We really are getting right down into that strong gravity regime right next to the event horizon of a black hole. Uh, actually, I'd say it exceeded my expectations. There were simulations of what this might look like, and they look more or less exactly like this. But I thought, oh, with scattering of light and instrumental effects and noise, you know, they'll be lucky to get it to get the prediction as accurately as that. But it looks bang on, so it's pretty pretty special. So here, yeah, we're seeing this radio synchrotron radiation from the immediate vicinity of a black hole. And you can see the black hole itself shadowing. Uh, the light, so you can see its influence. Um, it's pretty special, yeah, that people will be analysing these data for years to come, I think. So um, it feels like a, it does feel like a real breakthrough, yeah. Well, I mean, so remember, you're looking at radio waves here, so you can actually make this any colour you want it to be, yeah. fundamentally. Um, and they clearly just picked something which looked nice. You know, you could have perfectly well have done it in black and white, or, you know, because these are what you're really looking at here are millimetre waves, not optical light at all. So yes, there, are, there is a certain matter of aesthetics as to what color you end up reproducing these images in. And it makes a big difference. That's the other interesting thing that you know, NASA employs uh, graphic designers who know what looks really nice because you do have that degree of freedom because it is all about how you present the data. And you know, it's not, there's no dishonesty here in that there is no right color because as I say, these are radio waves. Radio waves aren't either blue or green, they're radio waves. So actually you really can pick whatever color looks nicest. You know, if a galaxy is the size of a football, the supermassive black hole in the nucleus is the size of a hydrogen atom. So they're absolutely tiny. But the energy they can produce is, and they, it, they can, uh, more than enough to blow the galaxy to bits many times over. So they, uh, understanding the link between these supermassive black holes, like the one they found, they, they announced today, and the broader galaxies that they're embedded in, I think that's a really key issue. For me personally, it's an area I work on. Uh, how do galaxies form? How do they switch off forming stars? Black holes may play a role. And now we know that there really are black holes in there. So well, we knew that before, but we've got an actual image of one for the first time. So you know, there's been loads of evidence for black holes, but no actual image to take a, you know, a picture of one. So it's pretty special. We've made quite a few videos about black holes over the years. 
I'm going to put a link in the video description and here on the screen. Also our astronomy channel Deep Sky Videos, we've got a video all about M87 already on there. So if you want to find out more about M87, again, links on the screen, video description.